Okay, so this question says two slits of some width uh, are separated by a center to center distance. Okay, so I'm beginning to recognize it's describing what we call, what the textbook calls double slit diffraction pattern. That is, when we handle the double slit interference, we treated each of the slits in the double slit as if it was of an infinitesimal width. But um, but the real physical slits, like one you will see in the lab uh, tomorrow, uh, next week, it, it has a, a fine, uh, it has non-zero size. There, it has an aperture size, hopefully the same. And they'll be separated by distance d. I guess that part hasn't really changed. So when you have this uh, physical double slit, then the kind of pattern that this produces on a screen far away, it's going to be an overlap of the two patterns. So the one pattern you might remember is the double slit interference pattern that starts with the maximum in the middle and it has kind of an equal heighted, um, almost a tooth comb like a pattern. Um, how wide it is, it kind of depends on the separation, the smaller the separation, the wider. Let me just draw something like it. So that's the double solid interference pattern, narrow, um, kind of the same height for all the maxima. And then there's a superimposed pattern on top of that. There's a, the single slit diffraction. And because these two slits will be the same size, the kind of the pattern that comes from them will be more or less the same. So you can just look at one of them and uh, think through what that pattern looks like. In the middle, you have maximum, that's the central maximum. And some distance away, you are going to have the first minimum. So it will look something like this, and then there will be a secondary maximum, and then minimum, and so on. So when we say the pattern, I'm not able to draw this right. Uh, it, it won't be to scale, don't worry. <laughs> um, so when we say the pattern you get is a combination of these, you kind of you can think of these two patterns of multiplying, um, and that that'll give you a pattern that kind of looks like this. I, I guess if you do this, uh, where you are um, erasing the like, think of the single solid diffraction pattern like an envelope, and the double solid pattern getting erased. It's not that's not too far. Um, the more correct picture when you are um, when you are multiplying them, would it be like this uh, sinusoidal thing actually uh, maxing out there, maxing out here, and then so on, something like that. That's uh, more accurate, but in terms of visualization, uh, what you get by just erasing those, that's fine, close enough. So, so that's the picture I want you to have in mind, because that'll help you answer the questions that they'll be asking. It asks, how many peaks of interference, these, will be observed? in the central maximum of the diffraction pattern. So the way to do that counting is to think of through, okay, um, I'm going to have a diffraction minimum somewhere like over here. And the, the position of that due to diffraction uh, minimum will be given by this expression that's been derived in the textbook. Aperture times sine theta is equal to some whole number times lambda. And for this very first order diffraction minimum, I know what that n is. That n is going to be 1. So 1 times lambda. That's, uh, that gives you the location here. And all these interference maxima, they are given by this expression. d times sine theta, where d is the slit separation is equal to some integer m times lambda. m can go from 0, plus minus 1, and so on. So this is 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2. So um, what we can do is we can count out, OK, so what value of m corresponds to where that interference maximum overlaps with the uh, diffraction minimum, or comes close to doing that? And as you look at it, I think uh, there's a kind of a shortcut we can take. I see these two expressions share a lot of the terms. So I can imagine doing this. I can take the thing on the top and just uh, divide it 
by the thing on the bottom. By which I mean doing a simple algebra like this. Take the left-hand side here, divide it by the left-hand side here. Okay. Um, um, a sine theta divided by d sine theta. And for the right-hand side, I take this thing here, divide by this thing here. Lambda divided by m lambda. Oh, I probably should label this 1 and this 2. 1 and 2. Um, so I can do that because uh, just uh, in terms of, you know, I have this equation and this equation tells me this is equal to that. So I'm basically dividing both sides by the same number. I'm just choosing to express the same number in two different ways. And when you do it that way, some of the things kind of cancel out. Lambdas cancel out. Um, I guess m stays. So let me write it down this way. Uh, sine of theta 1 over sine of theta 2 is equal to um, this thing here, 1 over m. And I'm imagining having multiplied through by d over a to get this by itself. So I have uh, times d over a on the right-hand side. Now, in the cases where you get this overlap, you have theta 1 equal to theta 2. So this left-hand side will become 1 for the value of n that leads to this overlap. And I kind of looking at this and see that they are integer multiples of each other. So I can kind of guess that, oh, they are go actually going to overlap because there's no guarantee they would. Here they will. So, um, so I can kind of make that assumption. Theta 1 equal to theta 2. So that ratio is 1. So on the right-hand side, I'm looking at, okay, so I need uh, some value of m that will satisfy this equation. So oh, I guess I can multiply both sides by m. Doing that gets me m is equal to d over a. So I can see this is d, that is a. So here d over a is equal to 4. So m equals 4 is where they um, overlap and you don't see the maximum that you are expecting. Everything else in between is part of the central maximum. So I have m equals 0 and m equals plus minus 1. I'm counting 2 at a time. m equals plus minus 2 and then um, m equals plus minus um, 3. <laughs> and so that's a 7. So it's going to be 7 here. I'm sure smart people can come up with the actual pattern um, in those numbers, but I can count with my fingers, and that will give me correct enough of an answer. Um, uh, if I had to guess what that pattern is, it's probably 2, that m minus 1, um, if I had to guess. Okay, how many peaks of the interference will be observed if the slit width is doubled while keeping the distance between the slits the same? So um, D is doubled while A is the wait, wait, no, no, so A is doubled while D is the same. Um, that means your single slit diffraction pattern is narrower, so you will be able to fit fewer maxima. And I think in looking at this, basically what you're going to get is half of that. So the value of M now will be 2 instead of 4. So you have basically 0 and plus minus 1, and then the, the kind of missing maximum. So it'll be 3. And I think if you use m equals 2 for that, then you get the same answer. Yeah. So that's a and b. Uh, C, how many peaks of interference will be observed if the slits are separated by twice the distance while keeping the width of the slits the same? Oh, so this time, I think uh, we are... Um, doing the opposite. So I think by when they say keeping the width of the slits the same, I mean keep the slit as 3 micron and make the center to center distance 24. So under that interpretation, instead of multiplying by 1 half, I'm multiplying by 2. So with that, M will become not 4, but Eight. Oh, so that's becoming large enough here. Uh, I, I don't have enough fingers. Um, so let me trust this formula and use it. So with m equals 8, that's a 16 minus uh, 1, so 15. Uh, so if I used my toes in addition to my fingers, I could have counted it, but I'm wearing socks today. Um, so 
So that should, those should be correct. Let me uh, go double check. So it's going to be 7, 3, and 15. Seven, three, fifteen. Let's hope that's correct. Good. <laughs> uh, what will happen if uh, A in A instead of five ten nanometer of light, another light of some other wavelength is? Oh, so I hope you saw that wavelengths got cancelled. Nothing changes. I mean, the overall pattern might uh, be larger or smaller. That's the only change that would occur. Um, but in terms of the n numbers, like the answers here, they don't change. So let's see. In addition to other changes, number of peaks, yeah, that doesn't change. That could be right, let's see. Uh, in addition to other changes, the number of peaks of interference in, no, that doesn't, number of peaks of interference in the central maximum remains the same. Yeah, overall pattern becomes, okay, I gotta think of this through. Does it become wider or narrower? So longer wavelength means it diffracts more. So uh, overall pattern becomes wider. <laughs> And I say longer wavelength means it diffracts more based on my intuition. Um, if you don't have it yet, then you can look at these formulas. If lambda is greater, then yeah, the, for the same, everything else, the same theta would be greater, meaning wider pattern. So that should be the correct answer. Yeah, good. So that's that question. All right, so this question says, for a double slit configuration, where slit separations, uh, it's uh, making reference to slit width. So this is again the uh, double slit diffraction pattern question, where you have some slit width, um, and you also worry about the slit separation. So the kind of the pattern you get. Um, so imagine you have a screen far out here. The kind of the pattern you get will be combination of the two. So one pattern that kind of acts like an envelope is the single slit diffraction pattern. You have the central maximum and then uh, like a secondary maxima, central maximum, first order minimum, and then the secondary maxima. And then within that broader single slit diffraction pattern, you do have um, narrower double slit interference pattern. The kind of comes from a multiplication of those two functions you might get in the derivation. By the way, I'm not really drawing this to scale. I'm just showing it more. And your textbook has some good pictures of it. I think, uh, let's see here. Um, so in section three, I think there's a picture of that pattern. Um, it, yeah, it looks like that. Um, I mean, that's the plot. And I thought they had an actual picture. Um, Oh, you know, they might have put the picture in the actually double slit interference, not double slit diffraction, which is yeah, Young's double slit interference. And I think, uh, uh, so yeah, the pattern here is actually that double slit diffraction. Because uh, it when they talk about the double slit stuff, they are referring to this narrower pattern here. And this minimum is actually single slit minimum. Uh, do they have other pictures? Where did I get that picture with the um, the red light? I might have gotten it from Wikipedia. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so that's the per uh, um, scenario you are thinking of. Hey, having this good mental image is helpful for answering through this. So it's asking, um, so first it's uh, specifying that the um, the slit separation D is equal to five times the slit width. And how many bright interference fringes lie in the central peak of the diffraction pattern now? So a good number to have here is, um, so there's a, what we call missing order. Uh, you will hear reference to that during our lab next week. Um, so that's where, uh, according to the double slit interference formula, that gives the interference maxima that says d times the sine theta is equal to m lambda. So there's a, a value of m that corresponds to this location here. That would have been an interference maximum. But you don't see it because that happened to coincide with a value of n that, um, that gives you the first order diffraction minimum, uh, which would be 1. And the, the location for that comes from 
a times sine theta is equal to n times lambda, where n is equal to 1, 2, and so on. In this particular case, you are looking at n equals 1. So for that location, these two angles happen to be the same. So if you imagine kind of doing this division here, what you would end up with is d over a, two sine theta's cancel out, is equal to m lambda divided by lambda. Lambda's cancel out. So you get this expression for that m of the missing order. It's d over a. So given this uh, information, that m must be 5. So it's a matter of now counting, OK, how many non-disappeared bright fringes are there? There's one that corresponds to 0. There are two that corresponds to plus 1 and minus 1. So OK, 0, plus 1 and minus 1, plus 1 and minus 2, that's 5, plus 2 and that was 1, 2, plus 3 and minus 3, and plus 4 and minus 4. So that's 9, 9 fingers. So there must be 9 bright fringes. And as I was saying with the other question, I'm sure you can come up with a, the uh, more general expression, you know, given this M, how many fringes are there? You know, I'll leave that as an exercise for you. For me, I got 10 fingers, so 9, I can get it within my 10 fingers. So...